we will be discussing the uh, topic of wide qrs tachycardia and as we know it is one of the most important uh, clinically relevant topic as well as uh, if you are going for final md exam this is going to come for ecg for sure so let's try to learn from expert and in between or at the end of lecture you can ask uh, queries to him and we will see uh, if something is there uh, today i have to ask directly i won't be actively uh, participating today in the discussion so you can ask her directly for the same uh, so over to you sir yeah. so good afternoon everybody so today we are going to discuss an important topic that is a wide qrs or what is more, more popularly known as a broad qrs tachycardia uh, we know it, it is called wide when the duration of qrs is more than 120 millisecond and the heart rate is more than 100 100 per minute it is far more commoner than the narrow qrs tachycardia excluding the atrial fibrillation uh, because the structurally abnormal heart are more common than the structurally normal heart which produce a narrow qrs tachycardia so i will try to go slow because this is one of the most common thing not only in the exam wise but in the practical purposes we see a lot of ecg with a broad qrs tachycardia in our icus and in the wards so let's discuss in yeah so whenever you get a ecg or get a patient with broad qrs tachycardia it is very important to know the underlying history because if you have a patient who has a history of heart disease like a history of previous mi or a previous underwent angioplasty or a previous uh, scar in the myocardium or a history of angina or a history of heart failure then the chances of the ecg being a ventricular tachycardia is almost 95% this is in uh, comparison to the pe people with structurally normal heart so if you see a ecg with wide qrs tachycardia and you have a structurally normal heart then out of 10 8 times you are likely to pick it pick it up as a ventricular tachycardia so 80% of time if you tell that it is a ventricular tachycardia it will be correct however if you have a history of a heart disease or a structurally abnormal heart 95 to 98% time you will be right in calling it a ventricular tachycardia the second important points are patients with tachycardia ventricular tachycardia or older than the svt this is uh, a general statement however not always all of them may be may be true like a patient who have a structurally normal heart or a idiopathic ventricular tachycardia or fascicular tachycardia or a outflow tract tachycardia they tend to be younger and with a structurally normal heart though overall the vts are more older than the svts with aberrancy also if a patient has uh, svts they tend to have a multiple previous episodes and the history will be longer compared to a vt which usually present when they present they have a first they present with a first episode also as compared to ventricular tachycardia which are more commonly hemodynamically unstable with a history of heart disease the his patients with svt with aberrancies are usually hemodynamically stable again the exception being a patient with structurally normal heart there the vts are usually hemodynamically stable now the most important thing is whenever you see a broad qrs tachycardia always look for the clinical triad of av dissociation the av dissociation which we see in almost 20 to 25 percentage of patient with ventricular tachycardia the triad is we see a canon a waves in jvp that is the atria will be contracting against a closed tricuspid valve and there will be av dissociation second there will be variable intensity of the first heart sound and there will be systolic bp variation which is unrelated to respiration all this because the atria and the ventricle are uh, not related to each other and they are contracting uh, uh, in in a non synchronous fashion so this three triad clinically is very important in a patient with av dissociation we know in a patient with otherwise also in complete heart block which has av dissociation we get something known as canon a waves which are usually irregular and with a bradycardia however in vt the canon a waves are in a tachycardia and they are usually irregular now most of this uh, white qrs tachycardia if they are svt with aberrancy they usually terminate with physical maneuvers like the carotid sinus massage and and with some medications so this is how in the based on history you have to see the white complex tachycardia I, as i already told it is no it is a wide qrs when the qrs duration is more than 120 and the heart rate is more than 100 however not all of them are sustained few of them may be in non sustained that, that is what we called it non sustained ventricular tachycardia where it lasts less than 30 seconds so in non sustained vt is what le, uh, occurs for less than 30 second in duration yeah so this is a prototype uh, sorry 
Yeah. So uh, when we if see a ECG with white QRS tachycardia, there are a lot of differential diagnoses. However, we should always keep in mind that the two most common are ventricular tachycardia and SVT with apparency. And that is what the today's class is all about. We have to differentiate a VT from a SVT with apparency based on some 10 odd features or a criteria. So we'll come to it. However, as I already told you, 80% of the time, if you tell it's a VT, you will be right. And in a patient with structurally normal heart, 95 to 98% time, you are right in picking up a VT just by telling it is a VT. The other rare differential diagnosis include a SVT with bundle branch block. Like if a patient has pre-existing right bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block, and if a patient develops SVT over that, then they, it will be a white QRS tachycardia. Also, if there is any SVT with a delayed conduction due to the drugs, like a class 1A and 1C antiarrhythmic drugs, or if it is a hyperkalemia, then we can get a white QRS tachycardia. Also, the rare uh, causes being antidromic AVRT. This we'll discuss in later, sometime in may, maybe some other class where we know uh, we have a AVRT, that is atrioventricular reciprocating tachycardia. We have an accessory pathway from the atria to the ventricle. Normally, this uh, pathways conduct both the sides. However, uh, so rarely they, this pathway may conduct only antigradely and rarely it may conduct only retrogradely. A antidromic uh, uh, AVRT is one where the atria to ventricle, the conduction is usually via the accessory pathways and back from the ventricle to the atria, it is via the AV node. And that is why it is called a antidromic AVRT. And because the, and, and, uh, the antigrade pathway is via the accessory pathway, we usually get a wider QRS tachy, wider QRS as compared to the orthodromic, where the normal uh, atria to ventricle conduction is via the AV node, and that is why it is a narrow QRS. This antidromic AVRT is usually rare; so it occurs usually five percent and less of all the patients with wide QRS tachycardia, or all the patients with AVRT. Now, the rare other causes being a pacemaker-mediated rhythm, which is very easy to pick up on ECG because you will get the pacemaker spikes and the other underlying history of the pacemaker. Now, these are the regular QRS, white QRS tachycardia. We know as a dictum that the, any irregular white QRS tachycardia is usually AF with pre-excitation. So if you see any white QRS tachycardia, which is irregular, 99.9% .9 time, it will be AF with a pre-excitation. However, there are two other rare causes of a irregular uh, white QRS tachycardia, which includes any irregular SVT, with aberrancy or a bundle branch block. And the v VT patients with e e VT in the first 30 seconds, due to the variation in cycle length, you may get an irregular white QRS tachycardia. So these are the all the causes of a white QRS tachycardia. However, in today's class, we are just interested in the first two diagnoses, that is a VT and a SVT with aberrancy. Now, this is the one of the ECG. I, I will come back to all this ECG uh, again at the end of the class. So, when you get a patient with a white QRS tachycardia, these are the 10 points on the basis of which you have to decide it is a VT or a SVT with apparency. Before going to this point, I always mention that you should always see the underlying patient, whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or not. A un a hemodynamically unstable patient, you are more likely to be dealing with a ventricular tachycardia patient. Also, if you see that the patient is having a history of ischemic heart disease or if the patient has undergone stenting or a bypass surgery or on the echo, you see that there is a left ventricular dysfunction or there is a scar or there is akinetic ventricles, then most 98% time you are likely to be right and to be calling it a ventricular tachycardia. After this, when you still have a doubt, you see the ECG and these are the points based on which you have to decide whether it's a VT or a SVT with aberrancy. Now, the coming to the first criteria, that is a QRS duration. Now, this is the, though we all the white complex tachycardia are white, there is a QRS duration above which uh, it becomes, VT is more uh, likely than SVT with aberrancy. Like if the patient has a LBBB morphology of a white QRS tachycardia, that is the V1 and V2 are negative and the LBBB morphology, and you have a QRS duration of more than 160 milliseconds. Or in patients with RBBB morphology of ventricular tachycardia, if the QRS duration is more than 140 milliseconds, so a LBBB with QRS 160 and a RBBB with a QRS duration of 140, then you are very likely dealing with a patient with a ventricular tachycardia. And this uh, criteria has a sensitivity of 70%. Now, 
there are fewer studies which we have well and showed that the 69% of VT have a QRS duration of more than 140 and none of the SVT showed a QRS duration of more than 140. So if SVT with aberrancy, it is very unlikely that the QRS duration will be more than 140 milliseconds. Now there are always exception because most of you would have seen a typical ECG of a patient with fascicular VT or what is known as a septal VT. So that if the VT, ventricular tachycardia is arising near the septum, more it is near the midline, that is from the fascicles or near the septal, the QRS duration will be shorter. So a patient with a fascicular VT, which has a typical, not very broad, but a QRS duration in between 120 to 140 millisecond, and you have a right bundle branch of morphology with a left axis deviation. So a RBBB with a left axis deviation and a structurally normal heart, the most common the diagnosis will be fascicular VT. Also, if the patient is on any antiarrhythmic, non-specific, prolonged, uh, non-specifically, it prolongs the QRS duration. So the, uh, so the moral of the, the slide is, if the QRS duration is narrow than the uh, one, uh, one, 140 millisecond, however, more than 120, then you are mostly the VT you are dealing with is from the origin of septum. So uh, again, I will come to this ECG later in my class. So this is the white Q uh, complex tachycardia. So if the VT origins close to the interventricular septum, like a septal or a fascicular VT, it is more simultaneously ventricular activation and a more narrower QRS. However, the more away it is from the interventricular septum, there will be sequential ventricular activation and it produces a wide QRS. So that is the typical of a uh, duration of QRS. Now, the second most important thing, which I think most of you will be seeing in a patient well need ECG is the QRS axis, because we have a tendency that see the AVR. The AVR, though it is a very neglected lead, we know. However, in a patient with wide QRS tachycardia, there is a good uh, significance of the lead AVR. So we see that a positive QRS, is, we, we, we tend to jump into the diagnosis of VT. Uh, most of the times you may be correct. However, we strongly many morphological and other criteria based on which we have to decide. However, the QRS axis, if there is a position plane of QRS axis, that is minus 90 to plus 180, which we know, which we also called as no man's land on an ECG. It is also called a northwest axis. Then you are very likely to be dealing with a patient with ventricular tachycardia. So a northwest axis or a positive AVR, if you have a only positive AVR without any Q, without any S, and you have only an R wave in a, on a positive wave in AVR, you're dealing with a patient with mostly a ventricular tachycardia. Also, many a times when you see a patient with a wide QRS tachycardia and you see that the baseline ECG of the patient, there is a significant shift of the axis. So any shift in QRS axis of more than 40, milli, 40 degree from the baseline, you may be dealing with a patient with ventricular tachycardia. However, there is a, the specificity is very less of this uh, point. So if the change in ax, uh, uh, axis from the baseline of around 40 degree or more is very uh, more likely that you are dealing with a patient with ventricular tachycardia. I think one of the very important point in a patient with ventricular tachycardia is any ECG where you see a right LBBB morphology, however, the axis is a right axis or you see a RBBB morphology VT and axis is left axis you can very confidently tell that you're dealing with a patient with ventricular tachycardia. So any RBBB with the left axis and any LBBB with right axis, you're dealing with a patient with ventricular tachycardia. Also, suppose if a patient has a baseline ECG of RBBB and the VT ECG is LBBB or the vice versa, then also you're most likely dealing with a patient with ventricular tachycardia. So these are important thing about the QRS axis, which you should know. However, always remember that none of the criteria has a 100% sensitivity and a 100% specificity. Now, third important point, again, which I think most of you will be looking is the concordance of QRS in the chest lead. We know that if it is all positive concordance or if it is all negative concordance, the, the chances of the ventricular tachycardia is very high. However, always remember that out of all the criteria, the sense the specificity of this criteria though is more the sensitivity is the least of all the criteria that is the concordance we know that either a positive concordance or a negative concordance means it should be all positive or it should be all negative means there should be no capital r capital s pattern rs pattern that is r and s view should not be there in any of the lead so if that is the case you are more likely to be dealing with a patient with 
ventral tachycardia however it is the positive concordance which is more commoner than a negative concordance and a positive concordance means the ventricular activation begins the left posteriorly and so the vt is arising from the left uh, post, uh, left posterior wall also if you have even a svt with aberrancy with a uh, rarely with a positive concordance then you may be dealing with a left posterior accessory pathway in that sense so always remember if you have a positive concordance or a negative concordance though the chances of vt is very high the sensitivity of this criteria is very less so this is how the ecg is you can see my cursor you can see from v1 to v6 on the right hand side it is all a positive concordance as compared to the left hand side you can see v1 to v6 it is all a negative concordance there are many other points on this ecg which i'll be discussing one by one so this is all a positive concordance and all a negative uh, concordance which means it is more likely to be a ventricular tachycardia now again coming to this ecg you see this ecg here it is not all positive concordance or and here it is not all negative concordance you see the lead v1 it is rs lead v2 it is rs it's everywhere however other leads like v4 v5 v6 it's not purely a positive or a negative it is a more typical of a rs pattern so when this is the case you should not tell that it is a svt with aberrancy however uh, you should still go and finding the other points for a vt in such case means a uh, not a positive or not a negative concordant doesn't means that it is svt with aberrancy it can still be ventricular tachycardia so you have to find out other points like a uh av dissociation is there or not or the morphological criteria which i'll come to it so we'll come to all the ccg once again at the end of the session now as i told you a concordant a qrs and limb lead so there is uh, as uh, i told you a positive avr or minus 90 to plus 180 tells a northwest axis there is one more po po point in the ecg which can tell that the it is uh, definitely northwest axis that is a predominantly negative qrs leads in lead 1 2 3 not v1 v2 v3 but limb leads 1 2 3 if it is all negative then again it is a way that it is a right superior axis and it is highly specific for vt so you can see this ecg on my left on the lead 1 2 3 it is all negative so it is all negative it means it's a right superior axis and it is more likely to be a ventricular tachycardia also if you can see the avr lead which is all positive which is has a very high specificity and sensitivity in picking up a ventricular tachycardia uh, as i all as a, as i'll come to in the next few slides most of us have a habit of just seeing a av dissociation on a ecg and telling that there is no av dissociation it is not a ventricular tachycardia however i would like to again emphasize the fact that av dissociation is seen only in 20 to 25 percent of patients with ventricular tachycardia 80 percent of them don't have a av dissociation that doesn't mean it is not a vt the presence of av dissociation is highly sensitive and specific for vt the absence of av dissociation doesn't rule out a ventricular tachycardia in this slide we have seen that the limb leads v1 2 and 3 have negative qrs which means it's a right superior axis and there is high likelihood of this ecg to be a ventricular tachycardia now the, again one of the important is the rs duration criteria in the precordial lead is not a peri sorry pericardial it's a precordial rs duration criteria so if you see a ecg and if you see that uh, there is some rs complex i as i already told you the presence of rs complex does not rule out a ventricular tachycardia the presence of a rs just says that it, it can still be a svt with aberrancy but you have to find out other uh, things to make it a vt so what when you have a rs uh, pattern you can see in this ecg the patient uh, my cursor is showing the patient has a r and a s pattern then from the beginning of r to the nadir of s from the beginning of r to the nadir of s if the duration is more than 100 millisecond so if the duration is more than 100 millisecond it means the chances of vt is very high it is 98 percent of the time it is a vt and the sensitivity is also 66 percent i think all this thing which i am telling you just tells one thing that the vt more likely traverses from the muscle to muscle and when it travels from muscle to muscle the intrinsic or deflection or the uh, the tip of r to the nadir of s the duration it takes to travel is very high the ventricular activation time is very high and so the duration from the beginning of r to the nadir of s is more than 100 millisecond so in a patient with a rs pattern 
not uh, positive or concord or negative concordant, but a RS pattern, if from the beginning of R to the nadir of S, if the duration is more than 100 milliseconds, you are more likely to be dealing with a patient with ventricular tachycardia. So this is one ECG where you should ideally not apply this because it doesn't have a RS pattern and so we cannot usually apply this. Now, let's go to the morphological criteria. So what is the morphology criteria is in a patient who have a RBBB type of VT. So a VT which is RBBB type means it may be arising from the left ventricle or a patient with LBBB where it arises from the right ventricle more commonly we know. So a RBBB morphology has few things which tells that it has to be a VT. Now, what are that? A only R pattern. So you can see down if you have only R or a you have a rabbit rabbit uh, ear pattern means the first R is always second taller than the second R. So if you have a first R which is taller than the second R, it means you're dealing with a patient with ventricular tachycardia. This is in comparison with the RBBP pattern where the second R is usually taller than the first R or a R dash is more taller than the R, then you're dealing with a patient with uh, SVT with aberrancy. However, a pure R or a RBBB with the first R more than the second R or a patient who has a QR, a small Q and a tall R in V1, these are the things which suggest that it is a VT and the specificity varies from 85 to 95%. So if you have a RBBB pattern and if you have in V1 any of these patterns, then this suggests that it is a VT. Now, the second important thing is, yeah. so in this, again, it is one of the same ECG where I showed you it is the RBBB pattern. You can see V1 and V2, it is the RBBB pattern and we have a pure tall R. So a pure tall R in this sense usually tells it is a ventricular tachycardia. Now you can see this ECG again, we have a RBBB pattern in V1 and that first R is usually second taller than the second R. So a first R, taller than the second R usually is consistent with a VT. And as I told you, you can see here, there is RS pattern. So a RS pattern does it means an absence of a positive or a negative concordance doesn't rule out a ventricular tachycardia. However, it just tells that SVT with aberrancy is possible. However, we have to find the other features. So the other features are, if there is no AV dissociation, the third criteria you have to see is the intrinsic point deflection. So you can see from the beginning of the R, as it is definitely more than the 100 milliseconds. So from the beginning of R to the nadir of S, it is more than 100 milliseconds. So it means the chances of ventricular tachycardia is very high. So when you see the V1 pattern with RBBB, you should always see the V6 also. Because if you have a RBBB in V1, then the V6, you have an RS pattern, then the RS ratio or a deep S in V6 or an RS ratio less than one, with the RBBB pattern suggests that it is a ventricular tachycardia. So if you have RBBB in V1 and V6, if you have a RS pattern with a ratio of R to S less than one, that means you are more likely to deal with the patient with ventricular tachycardia. I won't confuse with you all the patterns. However, just remember that a RBBB with a deep S or a RS ratio, if you have a small R and a deep S, it means you're dealing with the patient with ventricular tachycardia. Again, the same thing, if you can see in this ECG, there is a, uh, though there is no, uh, 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 there is RS pattern, we have to see other feature of v VT, which is a RS R dash pattern, means RBBB with the first R, which is taller than the second R, and R by S ratio in V6 is less than one. So this suggests it's more likely to be a ventricular tachycardia. Yeah. Now again, let's, uh, uh, I will again come to all of the CCGs in the end. Now let's discuss what happened in a patient with left bundle branch work. So if you have a left bundle branch work, the, the, the ECG, it is more, com uh, just to be very clear, it is more commoner to have a RBBB morphology of a white QRS tachycardia than LBBB because most of this uh, VTs in a structurally abnormal heart arise from the left ventricle and so they are the RBBB of a morphology. Now, when you have LBBB morphology, you do not have too many criteria to have a diagnose in the uh, precordial leads. However, if you have a LBBB and if your V1 shows a, a intrinsic notching or a slurring, and it means the intrinsic white deflection from the beginning to the midpoint of uh, R is very more. It means 
it is a uh, ventricular tachycardia this again just suggests that the ventricular activation time is more so the ventricular activation time is more and, and it travel from muscle to muscle and that is why you get a slurring or a notch in the midpoint of lpvv or a, a qrs and that is why in v1 you get a small r and t pass with a notch and the intrinsic or deflection is very high now with this pattern if you see a v6 which is again a small q any q in v6 in a patient with lbbb tells that it is a ventricular tachycardia so if you are dealing with a patient with lbbb you are getting a small r and a t pass with a slurring or a notching in v1 v2 and the v6 shows any q it means it is a ventricular tachycardia this is in comparison to the svt with aberrancy where where though you have a small r the duration of a small r is not more than 40, 40 millisecond and there is a uh, steep or a sleek or a quick down stroke as compared because it travels from the accessory pathway and not from muscle to muscle also you do not get any q wave in patient with svt with aberrancy now again i will go to the same lbbb uh, one of the ecg yeah so you can see this is a uh, ecg with lbbb you can see lbbb pattern but the r small r the duration is not more than 40 millisecond and you have a steep or you have very fast down stroke it is not like a very slow down stroke so there is no slurring in the qrs so it is more likely to be a svt with aberrancy however you again go to all the criteria you have a rs pattern still you have to search for features of vt so when you search for vc features of vt we do not have a ev dissociation we have to see the morphology criteria so this is the lbbb however there is no slurring in the qrs so it means the chances of svt with aberrancy is uh, high likely see I, i would have kept 10 ecgs in this uh, forum however as you know the chances of svt with aberrancy is very less so even if you have a collection of 100 ecgs you will get only 20 20 ecgs with svt with aberrancy 80 ecgs are more likely of a ventricular tachycardia so a collection of svt with aberrancy ecgs are less likely than a collection of ventricular tachycardia ecgs so this is one of the maybe one of the few ecgs which has a svt with aberrancy in it now this is one of the again a criteria which has a high specificity is a ambiguous leakage lead pattern we know that a w pattern or a m pattern m pattern means a uh, m pattern is nothing but a rbbb where the first r rabbit ear so first r is always more than the second r and it has been uh, very highly suggestive of a ventricular tachycardia and as i told you w pattern so a w pattern with a w the slurring in the qrs and then a small uh, peak and then the second peak that is known as the lbb pivot pattern and that is highly ambiguous for a, a ventricular tachycardia now just to be a spotter this is one of the ecg i want i know that we are more commonly dealing with vt and svt with aberrancy however if you see one ecg as i told you this is a broad qrs tachycardia which is definitely irregular so any broad qrs tachycardia which is irregular you have to consider a diagnosis of af with pre excitation because 99% of time a broad qrs tachycardia with irregularity suggests af with pre excitation now very it is very less likely that you will encounter such type of ecg however when you encounter and the patient is hemodynamically unstable the first treatment remains the cardioversion however if the patient is suppose hemodynamically stable it means that you have to give drugs and you should always remember that in such cases you should avoid drugs where you increase the conduction to the uh, pre accessory pathway so the drugs like beta blocker or calcium channel blocker or digoxin should be avoided because they decrease the conduction they uh, decrease the conduction via the av node and they increase the conduction via the accessory pathway and then this af and all may terminate into a vt and vf and it may be life threatening so you should always use drugs like a propenamide or a propofenone or a ibutalide in such case so this is one of the again a rare ecgs i wanted to be diverted off the track so that you should just not know as p or a vt but you should always remember that a irregular uh, white qrs tachycardia always suggest a af with a pre excitation pathway this is again the same ecg in a smaller frame <coughs> now again coming to the sixth important criteria is the presence of a q wave now this is one important thing because whenever you see a white qrs tachycardia you should always see the patient baseline ecg now why that is important is one 
as i already told you the baseline ecg will give you an idea of what how much access has uh, there is a change so if the patient has a lbbb morphology vt and you have a rbbb on baseline ecg means it definitely suggests a ventricular tachycardia if the patient has q waves in ecg and suggestion of old mi like a r loss in ecg or a patient has q wave in inferior lead suggestive of a old inferior wall mi pattern then it means that there was a structural heart disease and the old mi at the vt is the most likely diagnosis so this is the importance of a uh, baseline ecg in patient with wide qrs tachycardia however in generally the patient with post mi vt they maintain the q wave even during the wide complex tachycardia that is one important thing however there are important some exception to this rule if a patient had dilated cardiomyopathy then even if you do not have a baseline q wave they may have a baseline they will have a q wave during the ventricular tachycardia that is one important thing also you may get in patient with svt with aberrancy a pseudo q wave with a retrograde p wave so a pseudo q wave with a retrograde p wave deforming the qrs may be seen in patient with svt with aberrancy also the patient with svt with aberrancy with posterior connection they can have q wave in inferior lead that is also called as a delta wave so a delta wave can be seen in inferior lead which has a posterior accessory pathway left or right posterior accessory pathway so that can have a that can be, that you will be most of the time many a time people confuse with the inferior wall mi so they tell that it is inferior wall mi that is but though it is a negative delta wave so that is few important things about the presence of a q wave in ecg now coming to the most important point which i have been telling again and again is the presence of av dissociation and as i already highlighted if you get a av dissociation 98 to 99% of the time you are correct that it is ventricular tachycardia however if you do not have a ventricular uh, av dissociation only 20% of the time you may be correct that it is not vt it can still be vt 80% of the time so only 20% of the patient with ventricular tachycardia have av dissociation now what are the clues for this av dissociation is as i already told you see the patient clinically you get a canon avos which are irregular then you get a variable intensity of the first heart sound and you get a variation in systolic blood pressure which is unrelated to respiration so these are the typical clinical points in a patient with ventricular tachycardia next is av dissociation so what typically is av dissociation is you see more qrs than a p wave so there will be hidden p waves in the ecg one it is always dependent on the experience of the observer if only if you look carefully then you will get second try to look at the uh, uh, look in the lead which is very obvious so a lead where the qrs morphology is very good you see in those lead many a time we see AV dissociation in lead like AVR, so that is one important thing. See in a good wave, it depends on the experience observer in uh, observer's experience. Many a patients with very high rate VTs are uh, going at around two hundred fifty three hundred. You may be able to miss a uh, AV dissociation. Also, if the patient has both AF and a uh, uh, VT, it is very difficult sometimes to get uh, to see a AV dissociation. So you get a AV dissociation with the atrial and ventricular rate ratio of less than one. and you get sometimes a 2 is to 1 av block due to the retrograde conduction so if there is a retrograde conduction you may get a 2 qrs and a 1 p wave so that is known as a 2 is to 1 va block and sometimes because of the high uh, high rate and because the there is a, a cycle the change in cycle length every time because of the atria and ventricles are contracting asynchronously there will be a variation in qrs amplitude so it is a qrs alternance and not the electrical alternance which we see in other conditions there will be a qrs alternance during white complex tachycardia there is also something known as the fusion fusion beat and capture beat what is a fusion beat is sometimes during a ventricular tachycardia when the ventricle uh, gives an activation complex at the same time there is an uh, there from the atria also there is a activation complex and both of this fuse and the resultant qrs is something between between a normal beat and a vt beat so that is known as a fusion beat and there is also something known as a capture beat which is a premature beat from the ventricle which you closely resembles a normal uh, intrinsic qrs morphology so that is a capture beat which has a intrinsic qrs morphology and rarely in a echo or in a esophageal uh, atrial electrogram you may be able to see the features of uh, vt like a ra contraction in relation to the ventricle so these are the clues for av dissociation now i'll be discussing in detail 
each one by one. Now, as I already told you, you can see this ECG. Uh, yeah. So this ECG has a. Uh, uh, this is a. Oh, sorry. So this is the patient with a AV dissociation. You can see uh, my pointer on the long limb lead too. As you go, you can see few of the P waves. So these are the way. This is one ECG where there the AV dissociation is very obvious. So in such cases, I think it may not take you much time. Hardly it will take you ten seconds to diagnose that the given white QRS tachycardia is ventricular tachycardia and not the SVT with aberrancy. So you can see the clear cut P waves or a AV dissociation. So in such case, the ventricular rate is around two fifteen, atrial rate is around hundred and twenty five, and so it is obvious that the AV ratio is less than. 0.58. It's not the ratio and all which you should know. It's just that the AV dissociation you have to look for in such cases. Now again, as I told you, there is two is to one AV conduction. So you can again see this ECG is for after every two QRS there is a hidden P wave. So there is two is to one AV conduction which we see in 15 to 20 percent of the patient with ventricular tachycardia. Now, as I told you, if you see that uh, variation in amplitude of QRS during the white key complex tachycardia, and it is related to the presence uh, variable ventricular filling in presence of AV dissociation. So when we have AV dissociation, the ventricular filling is variable, and that is why the uh, QRS morphology varies in amplitude. Now, again, you can see this ECG, you can see the limb lead, you have a multiple uh, small P waves, which are uh, actually suggestive of AV dissociation. One more important thing which this ECG has, I can show you with this. This is something which is very li likely to be a, uh, a fusion bit and no uh, not a capture bit because the, uh, the morphology is something between a normal intrinsic beat and a QRS complex. So it's more likely to be a fusion beat in this ECG. And you can also see that there is a QRS amplitude variation. So these three points are usually suggestive of a ventricular tachycardia. Uh, if you can see again this ECG, in this ECG again, if you see there are few of the, yeah, sorry. So these are the fusion beats. I thought I had some, yeah, yeah. So this ECG again, sorry. So this is the ECG where there is a very typical capture. Bit. You can see this B, the what is written as C. It is a capture bit. You see the white QRS, which has a duration of around 120 to 140 millisecond. However, you see this C, which has an intrinsic morphology, something like a premature bit. And that is why it is a capture bit. As compared to this bit, which has a morphology in between this capture and the uh, white QRS bit. And that is why this is the fusion bit. So I have already told you the mechanism of the fusion and the capture beat. So this is something which is very important. Apart from the AV dissociation, the presence of a fusion beat, presence of a capture beat, and presence of a 2 is to 1 VA conduction, and a variation in amplitude of QR, that is QRS alternance. These are something which are very important to tell that AV dissociation is there. Now, there are some caveats of using the AV dissociation, as I already told you. AV dissociation has a sensitivity or specificity of 98%. However, the sensitivity is very low. However, its sensitivity further low is low due to faster heart rate. In presence of fast heart rate, sometimes it is difficult to pick up a AV dissociation. And if the inadequate duration of recording is there, and most importantly, it is the experience, observer experience. Sometimes even if uh, uh, a AV dissociation is there, we may be likely to miss it if we do not see it very properly. Also, 30% of the patient with VT with low ventricular rate have one is to one VA conduction. So if there is one is to one uh, VA conduction, we are more likely to miss a uh, uh, AV dissociation in those ECG. Also, AF and VT coexist, then AV dissociation cannot be diagnosed. So these are the few caveats of AV dissociation we should always know. Now, coming to the baseline QRS prolongation. If a patient with baseline QRS rhythm and the white QRS, Q, which is different, as I already told you, if a patient has RBBB morphology of VT and you have a baseline ECG, which is LBBB and the vice versa, then it is more likely to be a ventricular tachycardia. Also, the QRS during VT is usually narrower than the baseline rhythm. That is also one of the important things. Uh, so if a patient has a bundle branch uh, re-entrant tachycardia and the impulse originates in the right bundle branch block, so it travels through the left bundle and that is why it has a typical feature of a LBBB. And that is what it is, typical suggestion of VT. Now, 
coming to a lead which i always tell is a neglected lead is lead avr so i think one of the time apart from a acute mi when we see that avr is positive and there is diffuse st depression in all other leads which may, most of us uh, know that there may be a diagnosis of left main coronary artery disease or a multi vessel coronary artery disease white qrs tachycardia is one of the important time when you have to see the lead avr most of the time we know a tall a positive qrs means a Uh, right superior axis and that is why or a north west axis and it means it has to be a vt however that is not the only thing we are interested in lead avr there are many other things in lead avr which is important and tells that it is a ventricular tachycardia and what is known as a verecchi uh, verecchi criteria we should always know so if there is a presence of initial r wave in avr it means it may be suggesting ventricular tachycardia second if there is a presence of a initial r or a q with a duration more than 40 millisecond because we know ventricular vt travels from muscle to muscle the initial q or a r may be more than 40 millisecond in duration also if you have a negative qr as we know that most of the time a negative qr as suggests that it is not likely a vt and it may be svt with aberrancy however a negative qr as with a notch in the descending limb of qr as of negative onset it means that most likely we are dealing with a ventricular tachycardia because again the when vt uh, travels from muscle to muscle and then fourth criteria is vi by vt i will come to it with the help of an image so let's see a few of this now as i already told you uh, this is one of the ecg which we know uh, i'll come to the most important algorithm of vt which is known as the brugada algorithm most of the most of us will tell this as a uh, svt with aberrancy just seeing the avr algorithm however as i told you if you see the rs pattern in the lead that means there are chances that it can be svt with aberrancy so second thing you have to jump to the next criteria where which is the presence of a intrinsicoid deflection so we knew from the beginning of r to the nadir of s it is not more than 100 millisecond so we move to the third uh, criterion brugada i will come to it then that is the presence of av dissociation in this acg there is no av dissociation so the fourth is presence of a morphological criteria in morphological criteria we know in presence of a lbvp pattern we see that a small r whose duration is not more than 40 millisecond and there is no slurring in the qrs it means that it is not suggestive of a vt also in v6 there is no q wave if in v6 with lbb there is a q wave it suggests a ventricular tachycardia it means that more likely it suggests a svt with aberrancy and that is why our qrs uh, we see a qrs uh, vavr where the qrs is negative and there is no slurring in the uh, no definite slurring in this so that is what is one of the important thing now again going to the same uh, criteria here when we see this uh, ecg will be telling most of the time because avr is positive it is more likely to be a ventricular tachycardia let's again apply the brugada algorithm where the first point is uh, presence of a uh, rs complex so in this ecg we do not have a very typical rs but in v4 to v6 if you see predominantly negative qrs it means you are more likely dealing with a patient with a vt so we do not have a typical rs uh, pattern in any of the leads so second uh, uh, so here the likelihood of vt is very high because in the first step only you do not have a rs pattern uh, so the chances of ventricular tachycardia is very high so which is confirmed by the fact that though the first second r is taller than the first r we have a rs ratio with rbbb or a deep s in v6 we suggest that it is a ventricular tachycardia or also we have a tall avr avr which is definite positive it means it is a ventricular tachycardia now i was telling you in avr you should also know something known as the vi by vt that is the voltage in the initial 40 millisecond of qrs and the voltage in the last 40 millisecond of qrs now the uh, the why it happens is in svt only one portion of bundle branch is blocked and the, so the initial portion of qrs is rapid compared to the terminal as compared to a ventricular tachycardia where there is slow muscle to muscle spread of impulse which causes a slower voltage up throughout the qrs so the first uh, initial part we know uh, the there will be slower conduction so in the first uh, 40 millisecond it may be uh, the uh, the the Q voltage will be less as compared to the final 40 millisecond where the voltage will be more in patient with ventricular tachycardia here we can see the typical that it is very difficult this thing so you have to take it very carefully so if you see suppose here 
So in the first 40 millisecond, you see that the VI, there is a 40, there is almost four, uh, four small box. So it is 0.4 as compared to the last 40 millisecond, which is only 0.2. So a VI by VT more than one suggests associated with apparency, whereas a VI by VT less than one. So you have to see the voltage in the first 40 millisecond and see the voltage in the last uh, uh, 40 millisecond. It is very difficult to calculate this. That is why I told you, you have to see the uh, other important uh, points like a pos positive, if there is a tall or a only a Q positive QRS or is a negative QRS suggests associated with apparency. If you have a small Q, or small r with the duration of a q or a r more than 40 millisecond it is suggestive of a vt so these are the important things about the lead avr and finally when you come to the one of the last criteria which is the lead two so in the lead to the r v r wave peak time so if you see this r wave from the beginning of the r to the peak of r we have a around more than 50 millisecond which suggests that it is a ventricular tachycardia it is known as the pavas criteria so R wave peak time in the lead to is a high sensitive criteria that differentiates the SVT with aberrancy. It is one of the, again, one criteria where we should just know it. However, it is uh, just to remember and not where we don't use it practically in all our cases with white QRS tachycardia. Now you can see this ECG in lead to from the beginning of R to the uh, peak, it is more than 50 millisecond. And that is why it is highly likelihood of it to be a ventricular tachycardia. Uh, just in this ECG, just to apply, okay. So there are various algorithms which we use in a patient with WCT, Balance, Akta, Brugada, Griffith, Bayesian, AVR, and uh, lead to RVO peak time. However, just to know the most important criteria among all this, which has high sensitivity and specificity is the Brugada algorithm. And in the next 20 minutes, I'll take you through all of this ECG using the help of Brugada that how do we differentiate it is a case of uh, 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 SVT or a, v, a case of VT using the uh, criteria. However, there is one more important algorithm which we use more commonly is the AVR algorithm. So let's go to the Brugada criteria first and then come one by one to each of this ECG. Now, the first step is I have been telling you in all the ECG is the absence of RS complex in all precordial lifts. In the all precordial lift, if you have absence of uh, uh, RS pattern, it means that it is very, uh, it is there's a specificity of if being a VT is very high, that is 100%, and the sensitivity is very low. That is why I told you it may still be uh, uh, SVT with aberrancy, but you have to see the features of VT. That is why we go to the step two. So, in the patient, if you have RS pattern, then you see from the beginning of R to the nadir of S if there is more than 100 milliseconds. If it is yes, then again your uh, sensitivity is increasing from 21%, you have come to around 66% uh, uh, sensitivity. Now, if you do not have a more than 100 milliseconds, come to the third wave, which is AV dissociation. Now, if you have a AV dissociation, 98% time it is, uh, there are chances that you have a VT. If it, there is no AV dissociation, go to the morphologic criteria, which we have already discussed. And if the morphological criteria is mixed here, you are equally sensitive and specific to be calling it as a VT. So at the end of four criteria, it is 98%, 99% almost sensitivity and 97% specificity of it being a ventricular tachycardia. So this is the Brugada algorithm. I told you what is the Brecky algorithm, which is the AVR criteria is. You see the presence of an initial R wave, a initial tall R wave in AVR or a positive QRS complex it means the chances of VT is very high. If no, still it can be a SVT with aberrancy or a VT. So you see the initial R or a Q. So it has to be small initial R or a small Q and the duration should be more than 40 milliseconds. Then again, you are dealing with a VT. If no, then you see a notch on the descending limb of a, of, uh, of a negative onset QRS. And if you see a notch, it is a VT. And if no, then you see a VI by VT. If a VI by VT is less than one, it is a VT, and if it is no, then it is a case of SVT with aberrancy. So though we do not use very commonly the AVR criteria, if you use it along with Brugada uh, criteria, the chances of VT is very, uh, detecting a VT is very high. So this is what I told you just now about the Varecki algorithm. So the best algorithm for diagnosing a VT is a Brugada, AVR, and a Varecki combined criteria. That is the old and the new AVR criteria.
so in all the cases of vt try to find a reason to diagnose vt because in a patient with a structural heart disease 98% time you have to be diagnosing a vt so 98% of the time try to find a reason why it is vt and not svt with aberrancy and 80% of the time with structural heart absence of structural heart disease you have to get a vt so 20% of the time only your svt with aberrancy will be right so you have to find all the reason to diagnose that ecg as a ventricular tachycardia now i would like to go to each of this ecg again try to discuss at least 6 to 7 ecg one by one so i will try to apply uh, brugada algorithm i uh, to be frank i do not know the diagnosis of any of this ecg however if we apply the brugada algorithm 98% sensitive and 96% specificity however there is still 1 to 2% chances that we can still be wrong in any of this ecg and that is why the electrophysiological studies are made to confirm the diagnosis of a uh, uh, in the rare conditions where a ecg cannot pick up so let's uh, apply the brugada algorithm one by one so this is the ecg we have to see whether there is a rs complex so there is rs complex so the first uh, the step of brugada that absence of rs in any of the leads is not there so it can still be a, a vt or a svt with aberrancy so the second point was the presence of intrinsicoid deflection from the beginning of r so there, this is the beginning of r to the nadir of s so from the beginning of r to the nadir of s it is more than uh, it is more than 100 milliseconds so the chances of vt is very high so from the beginning of r to the nadir of s the duration is more than 100 milliseconds and that is why it is a ventricular tachycardia uh, so here we do not have to go to the third step that is the av dissociation however you can see that if we see very carefully there is no av dissociation and if you have to go to the fourth step which is the a morphological criteria you can see that a v1 there is rs r as the first r is usually tall with a v v6 r by s ratio is less than 1 so it is a ventricular tachycardia however in this case we have to stop at the step 2 because uh, the from the beginning of r to the nadir of s it is a one uh, uh, more than 100 millisecond so it is a vt ecg now let's go to this ecg again so again uh, uh i think before the uh, the most of the time how i deal with the ecg if i see if in any ecg if i see a rbbb morphology with the left axis deviation or an lbbb morphology with the right axis deviation it is more commonly i diagnose it as a vt most of the people have a tendency to directly jump onto the avr and see that is a positive qrs though it has a high sensitivity we should not directly jump to the avr lead because it is just a addition criteria to the existing brugada however if you see that you are definitely seeing a av dissociation that is the presence of p waves in between and av dissociation is there then you are very likelihood of it telling it a vt however if none of this is there i suggest that we should go in all our ecg with the brugada algorithm see the v1 again so uh, do you have a uh, positive uh, rs in uh, all the precordial lead there is no RA, uh, rs in all the precordial lead so we can see in v2 to v4 as i already told it is it is uh, all uh, negative almost a negative concordance in most of the and there is no rs so the chances of vt in this ecg is very high and that is why we should not try jumping it to the next Uh, uh criteria of the brugada algorithm however still still if we jump to the next criteria the second is the the beginning of the r to the nadir of the s however if that can be applied only if you have a rs pattern so here if, as we do not have rs pattern we may not be able to apply it still if you leave the av dissociation the third part the fourth criteria point of the algorithm remains with the rbbb pattern the presence uh, uh the uh there is a small r and a deep s so the ratio of rs is less than 1 which suggests a ventricular tachycardia so this ecg is again a ecg of a ventricular tachycardia this ecg i have already told but for our uh, discussion sake let's come to the brugada algorithm is there a presence of r to s so there is rs in few of the precordial leads so if there is a presence of r to s so the first point is ruled out it is uh, still it can be a vt or still it can be a svt with aberrancy we have to go to the second point so from the beginning of r to the nadir of s is the more than 100 millisecond no it is not more than 100 millisecond because this is r and this is s so still it is around 60 to 70 millisecond so it is not vt so we have to go to the next point 
the next point is the presence of ev dissociation which move, which is this ecg i cannot find so go to the morphological criteria the morphological criteria says if you have a lbbb with a small r and s qrs with a notching so there is no notching in this ecg with the lbbb pattern and there is no q wave in the v6 it means that it is not a vt but a svt with aberrancy so going by this brugada uh, algorithm 98% time and 96% sensitivity we are right that it is a svt with a aberrancy let's go to one or two more ecg and then we may yeah let's go to this ecg so in this ecg again let's see uh, as i already told you see this is a ecg where already we have a pointed uh, ev dissociation so it has to be a vt whatever you said and done so let's apply the brugada criteria Uh, absence of rs lead pattern no there are r there is s so after this uh, it can be svt with aberrancy or it can be a vt going to the point 2 if there is a rs from the beginning of r to the nadir of s if it is more than 100 millisecond is it yes no it is not more than 100 millisecond so it can still can be svt with aberrancy still can be a vt now we have to go to the third point that the presence of av dissociation so we have presence of av dissociation so the brugada algorithm is met so on the third point we have diagnosed it as a vt so again uh, we have diagnosed this ecg as a vt using the brugada however in this case i think you may not need to go to the three points of brugada algorithm in the first point itself we can see the presence of a av dissociation and tell that it is a ventricular tachycardia okay now coming to this ecg uh, yeah so here again i am sorry my few of the side wise it is cut again anyway uh, yeah this is the same ecg i think we have we have already discussed yeah, yeah same ecg we have discussed oh, so yeah let's discuss this ecg so again come to uh, coming to this ecg uh, yeah so the first point of brugada is is there is there a absence of uh, rs pattern yes in this we have all the precordial lead with few negative con here but in lead v3 we have a presence of uh, rs pattern so the presence of rs pattern we are definitely it can be svt with aberrancy or a vt go to the second point from the beginning of r to the nadir of s is there a is there a more than 100 millisecond no so it's it can still be svt with aberrancy or a vt is there a presence of av dissociation i can see can you see this this is the presence of p wave this is the presence presence of p wave so we have and this is the p wave we have a feature suggesting av dissociation and so it is more likely that this ecg is a vt again coming to this ecg uh, so we'll stop at this ecg we see this ecg going to the brugada algorithm then definite there is no rs pattern so uh, it has to be a vt however uh, let's counter check with other things Uh, go to the point two. We cannot use the RS pattern with R to uh, nadir of S because there is no RS. Third, is there AV dissociation? No, there is no AV dissociation. Can we apply the morphological criteria? Yes, we have a positive only R in lead V one, which tells that it has to be a VT. So it is very definite that this has to be a this ECG is a VT ECG. This ECG we discussed. It is a AF with pre excitation ECG. This ECG we have already discussed. this ecg we have discussed yeah let's discuss this ecg once before concluding so v1 to v6 there, there are definite r rs pattern in all this lead with the r to s it is there are chances it can still be svt with aberrancy now let's go to the second criteria which is from the beginning of the r to the nadir of s is it more than so most of this places we can see that there is a notching in this and from the beginning of r in some of this lead yeah like here it is not more than 100 millisecond from in v4 v5 v6 so still it can be svt with aberrancy still it can be a vt going to the third criteria av dissociation is there av dissociation so it is very difficult to see uh, av dissociation so go to the fourth that is the morphological criteria so if you have rbbb pattern with a v6 r by s ratio less than 1 we are more likely to be dealing with a patient with e vt so this is more likely a patient with a vt ecg because there is a pure tall r wave in this with uh, so this is a vt ecg more likely so these are the things which i wanted to conclude uh, to say i think we have seen enough ecg and most of this ecgs were 
a GP and accept one or two ECGs which were SVT with aberrancy. So the moral of the story being, if you're trying to use this algorithms, you will be very uh, wisely diagnosing the ECGs with the VT or SVT with aberrancy. Use uh, AV dissociation only if it is there to directly diagnose it. Don't go jump to the AVR to see that uh, it is a only positive QRS and so it has to be a VT. Use the other criteria also. And if the patient has LBBB morphology with right axis or RBBB morphology with left axis, most of the time it has to be a VT. So I will conclude here. If any questions are there, I will take.